A very warm welcome to all of you joining. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us in this session of the Fair Digital Finance Forum, which is accelerating fair digital finance in low and middle income countries. Uh, for those of you who are settling in, please don't hesitate to use the chat function to add comments and the Q&A for any questions to the panel. We'd love to hear where you're from. All of our sessions today have been truly global and have had some great questions. Uh, my name's Helena. I'm your moderator for the next hour. It's a pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the discussion. This session is a particularly important one for us. Consumers International is a global network. We have 200 consumer advocates in 100 countries. 132 of those consumer advocacy groups are in low and middle income countries. And they are particularly important for us as we think about how to build a safe, fair and sustainable marketplace for all of us. When we think about digital finance, they are very much involved. In uh, a year or two ago, I believe it was during the start of the pandemic, we actually reached out to our consumer advocates in low and middle income countries, asking them how they supported consumers in the growth of financial services. They were deeply engaged. Uh, they work on a variety of topics, as do most consumer advocates, from food to telecommunications, but financial services are a core area of focus. They provide consumer information. Uh, they do a whole range of different uh, approaches to support consumers in their marketplace, working directly uh, with uh, local policymakers and governments. They... Uh, noted a number of issues related to financial services in their markets, accessibility, affordability, but beyond that, data privacy, unfair contract terms, over-indebtedness, high inflation, lack of consum consumer protection, um, a whole range of topics which of course have been ex exacerbated uh, during the pandemic with a whole host of different scams, frauds, and consumer harms. Consumer advocates don't typically uh, sit still. Uh, they are doers, they are pragmatic actors. And the way in which consumer advocates typically respond is by helping handle complaints, consumer debt handling and counseling, market research to understand what's going on, awareness campaigns, representing the consumer voice to regulators and policymakers, and public interest litigation. So I'm really excited that we're able to focus this particular session during the Fair Digital Finance Forum on low and middle income countries and not just what they're doing now, not just what the issues are, but how we can build with them and build better. As part of that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about an accelerator that we'll be launching, which will support consumer advocates in low and middle income countries. And we'll hear from consumer advocates who are part of that accelerator about how we build with them. It's my pleasure to welcome true experts to this panel. On the panel, we have first Sophie Sirten. She is Chief Executive Officer of the Consultative Group to Assist the Poor. She also has 20 years of experience um, in financial services at the World Bank all over the world, in strategy, in operations, in crisis response, including during the financial crisis. Um, we have Michael Wiegand. Michael Wiegand is the Director for the Financial Services for the Poor at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Michael also has a career in financial services with multiple years, I believe a decade at Standard Chartered in a variety of regional and uh, global roles. And prior to that at McKinsey. Felicia Monnier is not only a professor in law in Nigeria, she drives standards in the country. Uh, she is a board member at the International Association of Consumer Law. And most important of all, if I can say it, she is a member of the Council of Consumers International. So I'm thrilled to have these esteemed speakers with us to help explore what are the issues uh, that consumers and consumer advocates in low and middle income countries are experiencing 
and how do we build better? Michael, if I can first come to you and we'll bring down the slides at this point. Um, in low and middle income countries, what are the dynamics in digital finance? And especially sort of given the changes over the past two years, what for you are the consumer protection challenges we should be thinking about? Well, thank, thank you. And uh, thank you to Consumers International uh, and all its members for the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been working for more than 10 years to leverage digital tools to bring formal financial services to those that have been previously excluded. Um, and progress has really been incredible. Um, between 2011 and 2017, more than 1 billion people were brought into the formal financial sector that were previously excluded. And this growth in financial inclusion has continued uh, and accelerated during the COVID pandemic. Um, the pandemic made it very clear that the, the value of digital financial services uh, to poor around the world, especially as people were limited in terms of mobility and contact, the ability to uh, use financial services remotely via the mobile phone was valuable. Um, and virtually every country in the world rushed to make social protection payments uh, to their most vulnerable citizens uh, in 2020 as the pandemic really started to uh, impact the global economy. Um, the World Bank analyzed 60 of these countries. Uh, 33 had reasonable levels of financial inclusion above 40% and um, strong financial or strong uh, national ID systems. 88%, um, so uh, 30 out of the 33 countries um, were able to make payments by June of 2020. So within just a couple of months, they were able to have money in the pockets of their most vulnerable citizens. Of those, there were 27 that did not have either strong financial uh, inclusion or the right ID systems. For them, only three of the 27 were able to make payments. So it was really clear to, to countries that digital financial inclusion enabled resilience and enabled them to respond. And therefore, what we're seeing coming out of the pandemic as countries start to, to build back and rebuild their economies, um, even greater energy and um, real action to drive financial inclusion across low and middle income countries. And of course, this new financial inclusion will bring great benefits to, to low-income people around the world, but it also brings risks. Um, you know, having access to instant payments across great distance also means uh, that uh, potential fraudsters can have access to accounts uh, at a distance. Um, and so there's a whole new set of risks. And similarly, being connected um, gives individuals access to information, but also there's a risk of their information being accessed. So we need to, in, in parallel with um, continuing to drive financial inclusion, it's important that we continue to drive consumer protection uh, with these new tools and with these new consumers that are coming on board. Perfect, thank you, Michael. I'm gonna come back and say what next, but perhaps at this point, let's continue to build the picture and I'll come to Sophie. Um, what are you seeing as the, the key issues um, uh, and building on the picture that Michael has, has built for us. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, can, thank you very much, Elena, um, for having me. It's a pleasure. You know, I'll start by saying that, of course, the pandemic has, I think, first and foremost, created enormous challenges uh, for the world and much greater poverty and exclusion. And we have um, members at the bank that show that millions of people have been pushed into poverty and that progress to reach the SDGs and, and our goals for the world have really been um, not, not only slowed down, but really there's been, we've, we've basically gone backwards on many of them. At the same time, I fully agree with Michael that the pandemic has allowed us to lay out foundations that we can leverage to build a better future. And I would like to highlight three. One is um, the fact that there's been enormous development across the digital economies in many, many countries. Countries have laid the foundations for a digital ecosystem to flourish um, in their economies. The second is what Michael, you, you highlighted, is the extremely fast development, um, I would say the unprecedented surge in accounts, digital accounts that were opened 
um, to transfer G2P payments um, um, through cash transfer, basically, and support for, for families and, and people through the pandemic. And these are not a panacea because an account we know is not the end of the story. Um, it's about usage and it's about the outcomes that the pool can read through these accounts, but it's, a, it's an enormous foundation, again, on which to build. And I think the third legacy of the pandemic is probably just a, a greater awareness of the fact that exclusion and poverty can make us all unsafe and therefore that it is in our common interest to rebuild um, a better future for all, a more inclusive future. And so financial inclusion, as Michael said, is part of the story, it's part of the solution. In terms of outcomes, what it brings to the poor is really an ability to join the digital economy, an ability to leverage income generating sources um, of, of living, abilities to access services that they need, and also an ability to build their resilience. So digital financial services in that context are essential, and so we're delighted to be talking about them. Um, as an example, um, just to give you some numbers, we have research that shows that M-PESA helped lift almost 200,000 people out of extreme poverty for one firm. That's, that's really amazing. Now, as Michael said, digital financial services come with risk, and it's important to mitigate them so that their benefits can be reaped. I'll just note one study from SIGA that we just published that highlighted the evolving nature of the risk involved. We highlighted, we identified about 60 consumer risk. Several are known risks, their data breaches, their SIM swap fraud, their aggressive marketing or debt collection practices, et cetera. Um, but what we notice are the highlights, just two key points. One is that the pace of development of these risks has started to surpass the rate of technological adoption and of digital financial inclusion. Just to give you um, one number, um, between 2017 and 2020, we noticed that the average annual increase in the total number of records exposed globally was 80%. So per annum, while the annual increase in volume of data created was 38% less than a half. The second worrying trend um, is that our research shows that those who are mostly affected by those risks are low-income women and rural populations. And that is because of their lower levels in general of financial literacy and, and digital skills. And in fact, rural women are the most adversely impacted. So there is a vicious circle whereby these risks can lower their trust in digital financial services and lead, of course, to further indebtedness and exclude them further. So we really have to see the benefits of digital financial services, but also mitigate the risk. I'll stop here. Well, that's a fascinating stat about the risks uh, outpacing the, the benefits right now and the urgency. Felicia, I'd love to come to you at this point. Tell us about the experience of the challenges, the opportunities that you're seeing specifically in your country. Okay, Helena, thank you. And um, everyone, thank you. It's really my uh, privilege to participate in this uh, program and the Consumer Forum in general. Uh, talking about the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, it was a situation that clearly demonstrated the need for digital financial inclusion because the, in Nigeria, during the COVID lockdown, uh, those uh, consumers on digital financial platforms were able to transact, were able to transfer money from um, to places, to receive money from different sources. But those not on um, uh, such platforms couldn't uh, transact and of course it was very difficult for them. So at the end of uh, the lockdown, people saw the need to uh, subscribe to digital financial services. And the need was felt both from the point of view of providers of services and consumers. Then uh, another, another effect that uh, was uh, clearly seen during the COVID lockdown was the fact that uh, when the government initiated the pro a program to uh, extend financial uh, support to the vulnerable and the uh, poor groups, uh, groups in the country, 
it was not possible with regard to those uh, that were financially excluded. Because you can't even talk about uh, financial, uh, digital finance without talking about financial inclusion. Because as far as the, um, I am concerned, and as far as we are concerned in our group, um, financial inclusion is the first stage. Then when you are financially included, then you can migrate, if you wish, to digital financial uh, services. So during the COVID lockdown, the government uh, initiated this project to transfer money to uh, the vulnerable groups. But it was impossible as regards many people because they were uh, uh, financially excluded. In fact, in Nigeria, the percentage of people that are financially included is put at uh, uh, 39, 39, 35.9%. Uh, uh, and that is a huge number. So uh, after the lockdown, people felt the need to uh, subscribe to uh, not just digital financial services, but financial services as a whole. So uh, I can say that there has been an expansion, even though we don't like to uh, quote percentages without empirical research, you must do um, uh, a survey to know the number or the increase. But I can tell you that many people are now seeing the need for financial inclusion and digital financial services. Then as regards the challenges, there are quite uh, a number, or in fact, a lot of them. First is the high unemployment level in the, in the country. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, the percentage of uh, Nigerians that are uh, unemployed is 33%, uh, percent, and that is really high. Considering the, 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 um, the population mm -hmm. of the country, which is almost uh, 200, almost 200, uh, sorry, almost uh, 2 million, 2 million people in Nigeria and about, uh, about uh, 33 are not employed. Then that uh, is another related problem is uh, poverty. Many people live below uh, the poverty line according to the available statistics. And in a situation like that, you can't be talking about financial inclusion, not to talk about digital financial uh, services, because people are then talking about basic needs, you want to pay school fees for your children, you want to buy food and others. So that is uh, one challenge that we have. Then low uh, financial literacy is also another problem, because uh, digital finance, you need to have technical knowledge, some level of technical knowledge, then you, of course, you must know how to operate the devices, the smart, the smartphones, the computers, the credit cards, and the rest. So that's also uh, a problem in Nigeria. Internet uh, access is also another problem. Well, here I want to give credit to the regulator of the uh, uh, telecommunications uh, sector in Nigeria. That is the Nigerian Communications Commission. This commission has uh, um, initiated a program that is telecommunications, universal uh, access and universal service uh, program, which uh, tries to extend telecommunication services to different parts of Nigeria. But this notwithstanding, many uh, parts are still uh, either on the south or on south, especially the rural areas. So that is uh, a problem that affects uh, digital financial services in Nigeria. Cost Thank is you, also please. another thing. Um, cost, I can just mention because there's no time again, just cost, absence of law, um, educated law. But on the whole, we need a baseline study, a baseline survey to at least know the state of uh, affairs because some educated people are not even on digital financial services. So we need to find out the reason for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felicia, and we'll come back to you. Um, I want to come to Michael because one of the things we noticed, you mentioned the baseline survey, Felicia. This has been done actually with um, consumer advocates who are participating in our accelerator. They noted 97% of them are working on gender issues. Um, I wanted to come back to Michael 
kind of with a two part question, which you can separate into two. One is we, we haven't mentioned gender to this point. Are there particular issues that we should be considering as relates to gender? And then I want to get to a question that I'm going to come back to you with as well, Sophie. How do you see consumer advocates helping here? How would you see working with consumer advocates? Michael, can I come to you first? Yeah, we we absolutely have to be gender intentional uh, as we do this work. Um, from the beginning, uh, the foundation had closing the gender gap as one of the core objectives of our strategy, in addition to overall financial inclusion. And while financial inclusion has grown tremendously, uh, the, the gender gap has not. Uh, and it just shows that while um, you know, financial service providers feel like they're, they're designing uh, financial service for everyone, they're really designing for men and women are falling behind. In fact, the typical pattern is that the gender gap widens as a country moves from low levels of financial inclusion to higher levels uh, before closing later. Um, it's important from a consumer protection standpoint to focus on women for a couple of reasons. One, um, women suffer from disproportionate harm. And we see as we study uh, consumer protection and risk in financial services, this over and over uh, in a study in Ghana that looked at um, consumers being overcharged by agents when they conduct transactions. Uh, women were much uh, were, were, were um, overcharged at a much higher rate, three times the loss uh, of men. Um, and oftentimes you, the, the solutions that we imagine would work, for example, having women agents um, don't work. In, in fact, women agents overcharge women uh, as well. Um, we also see that women experience risks differently. When you look at data privacy, um, Daryl Collins and Derry Moore did a great study uh, across multiple countries looking at people's perception of risks and especially, especially around data privacy. And women, um, because they um, experience much greater harms from uh, ex ex uh, the, the release of their private information, take a very different view towards the risk around privacy. So we, we absolutely need to take a very gender intentional approach to all the work that we do. And you know, a lot of the focus today is on, on elevating the voice uh, of, of the poor in financial services. We particularly need to elevate the, the voice uh, of women uh, as we try to um, drive consumer protection. Brilliant, thank you very much. And, and if I could give you a follow-up question, Michael, um, one of the, sort of things we're considering here at Consumers International is how can we be a constructive part of this? Um, we've noted that many uh, organizations working on digital finance are looking for an active consumer voice, um, a voice from consumer advocates to policymakers, a voice from consumer advocates to help educate consumers. How do you see the way in which consumer advocates who are listening from all around the world on this call as well, what can we do to join forces um, and change some of the issues we've just raised? Well, you already mentioned the, the Fair Digital Finance Accelerator and the Gates Foundation is very, very uh, proud to be partnering with Consumers International and with CGAP uh, to launch this initiative. Um, you know, first of all, the consumer advocates are in the best position to be listening to consumers and, and particular poor consumers and women to really understand what the problems uh, that, that they're facing with financial services. Financial services were stagnant for, for decades. They served a very small portion of the population in, in low income countries uh, and had a very um, stable way of being regulated and protecting consumers. That's just changing so dramatically with technology. Uh, Sophie mentioned how um, fraudsters and, and the risks are accelerating at a much faster pace than the underlying uh, financial inclusion numbers. Um, and so we can't rely on regulation staying ahead of the risk. And that's where um, consumer advocates elevating the voice of consumers is the best way to stay on top of what's happening day to day because it's evolving so quickly. Um, and so uh, bringing them into that discussion uh, and elevating the voice of the consumer advocates is gonna be critical if regulators really want to continue to protect consumers. 
Brilliant. Thank you so much. Sophie, can I come to you? How, uh, what are the ways in which we can incorporate consumer advocacy and the consumer voice into supporting and constructing and shaping digital finance for everyone? Thank, thank you, um, Elena. So first off, I very much agree that it's fundamental to involve um, the voice of consumers in um, both market monitoring, but also in addressing, defining ways to address um, the emerging risk. It's, it's particularly important in this case because of the fast evolving nature of risk. And so doing so can accelerate the ability of a, of a market conduct authority of a consumer agency to understand what's happening in their country by looking at others, um, but also to, to understand what has worked or not in other countries. So there's a huge value. I think in general, the World Bank shows that involving citizen um, voices in uh, policy making leads to more impact driven uh, and more inclusive outcomes. So uh, this is certainly the case here now, um, the case here too. Now, in terms of how you can do this, I think that consumer associations um, and groups can really influence policy and regulations in many ways. Um, of course, you can present, um, you first, first there's monitoring. You need to monitor and share knowledge and share the information you have on your market and what is happening. Second is pre pre sharing your, your knowledge on solutions and presenting all this information um, to regulators, um, either at your own initiative or when prompted, so that they can involve that, include that as they design or improve policies. And one example that I want to put um, for your consideration is the fact that the Indonesian Consumer Foundation influenced efforts to address e-commerce related fraud by commenting, commenting on draft regulation. Of course, consumer associations can also help consumers with complaints handling, dispute resolution, you can provide that counseling, conduct market research on race, race consumer awareness. There's plenty that, that, that is your normal business that applies here too. Now, there are instances where more formal processes are established to embed you um, and, and through you the voice of consumers in uh, financial uh, regulatory processes. And these are wonderful opportunities. For instance, when consumer advisory panels are established, um, it, an example is the Indian government health um, in-person consultation events on its data privacy bill, or the UK Financial Conduct Authority that has embedded um, a, a panel called the UK Financial Services Consumer Panel in its processes. So these are, of course, not always available, but when they are, um, it's a wonderful opportunity to more formally raise consumer, consumer voices. Lastly, I want to highlight the, the role of technology because it's not um, you, it's not always uh, a formal process that that you should leverage, given the relatively large use of social media um, in low and middle income countries. There's really an opportunity for uh, financial supervisors, consumer association, market conduct authority to really monitor complaints and facts through technology. Um, an example, for instance, is the fact that the, in the Philippines, the central bank launched a chatbot that enables consumers um, to file complaints just using SMS or, or Messenger, um, Facebook Messenger. So there's a lot of opportunities for you to leverage consumers through different means, more formal, more institutionalized, to less formal, less institutionalized, but all should be part of your palette of tools. Um, again, because the risks are changing so fast that you can't afford in a way to be um, slow and relying on only one source. I'll stop here. Brilliant, thank you so much. This brings us to the end of our first section of the conversation, um, after which we're going to go and dig into how we build this accelerator, this international community. I do want to thank uh, Sophie and Michael for their support over the past year. We've built together in a beautiful way to understand the issue, to really pinpoint how consumer advocacy can help in a constructive way. And to now start, we need to report back on the actual impact but we're at the start of a journey together to launch an accelerator which creates a community of low and middle income countries, the consumer advocates in those countries, uh, supporting them with insight, helping them uh, represent the consumer issues in their countries, 
building bridges with other stakeholders and into regulators and policymakers, and as a re result, addressing some of the issues that we've talked about in this first discussion. Uh, my personal thanks to both of you from Consumers International and our network for your wonderful support um, and uh, visionary approach to addressing these problems. So Michael, I think we have to say goodbye to you. So thank you, but please Sophie and Felicia. Sophie and Felicia, let's move into the second part of our conversation where I'm going to welcome two more consumer advocates uh, into the call. And if I can uh, see them joining and we're going to put up a slide to welcome them also. Uh, joining us are Saroja Sundaram. She is a member of the Consumers International Council along with Felicia. She is the di executive director of the Citizen Consumer and Civic Action Group in Chennai, India and Michael Mungoma, who's the Director of Programs at the Youth Education Network in Kenya. Um, all of you are already part of the Accelerator uh, Network. Thank you very much for this. And I'd love to um, really come to you and start asking, well, you, you've heard a little bit about the sort of the, in the first part of this discussion, how do you see the, the key issues I'd like to start us going into how do we, what it, why is it important to have an international community? What do you see as an international community allowing you to do differently? Michael, could I come to you first? Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Helena, and thank you for this opportunity to share. So I'm uh, Michael from Youth Education Network Kenya. And uh, just to dive in straight to, you know, the, um, the importance of the international community building among civil society uh, actors. I think it's important that if we come together, we can create a synergy and fine tune ideas. Yeah, while appreciating again the diversity of consumers globally, we all have different issues, uh, different parts of the world. But the, what runs through us is the fact that we are consumers and consumers are very powerful because they are the matrix of um, industry and businesses. Mm -hmm. So by coming together, we will have a, a global impact, you know, not just not locally, but, um, it, you know, the whole world and digital finance um, services are becoming more and more international than local. It's important to appreciate again that uh, what separates a lot of people is just the currencies, but otherwise the transactions, the nature of how we do things and the evolution of digital financial services seems to be having a common thread. Everybody is getting digital, whether you're living in an urban area or a rural area in any part of the world. So again, um, we are a global village. Uh, we need a common approach. We need a common approach to digital digital finance uh, issues, yeah, which um, again will help us uh, being one body to be able to mitigate future challenges. We are already experiencing uh, certain challenges that we've already had: fraud, online fraud, difficult in understanding because sometimes they use a lot of financial jargon. Mm -hmm. Having a global uh, village where people can interact uh, across boundaries requires then we also have a common language. That's, that's very important. So civil society can come together and address this, have a common platform. So the response again to some of these challenges can be shorter because these challenges will come. But if we have a, an umbrella sort of approach to things, then we'll, we'll have a very short response to and be able to create space to build on this you know, progressive evolution because this is, this is only going to grow. It's, we, we can't stop the digital financial service space. Um, and then the other thing again, um, CSOs, as was mentioned by Michael earlier, we, you know, we're strategically placed to bridge government and consumers. We, we, we are in between. We can listen to what governments are saying, digest that information and then be able to provide that information again to the, directly to the consumers and be able to understand what consumers are, uh, are saying. Uh, again, package it in a way that uh, you know, can be taken up by 
decision makers and policy makers and speed up the bridge between some of these things that are ongoing. And um, just to say again, you know, it's important that uh, if we continue building even existing uh, bodies, civil society actors that have already come together, with, whether it's African associations or the ASEAN Committee of Consumer Protection, or even just CI, if we build on existing linkages, I think we'll be able to address some of the issues that we have. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Michael. That was really encouraging and very practical in terms of um, how we do this practical advice about building on what's already there as well. So, Roger, um, how do you see this? Um, you know, perhaps what are some of the tools and levers that you see consumer advocates being able to build differently if we're in an international community together? So uh, to actually put an a international community together, actually, I think um, to empower consumer groups to represent consumer interests, I think it is very important too that should be leveraged. And uh, so some of these actually, the, like whatever comes to, uh, I'm telling, sharing now, most of this we, we are already practicing in our organization and uh, Many groups in India also do that. We demand that government bodies are transparent and put out all information in public domain so that consumers know and are able to participate in the decision-making process, which is very uh, uh, important, uh, I feel. And uh, also uh, we mandate that the governments and the regulators seek consumers' views on important decision-making processes. I think this, uh, uh, this applies across all um, uh, uh, regions and uh, uh, countries. Uh, so it, I think it's very important that they are transparent about what they do and also seek consumers' views because ground reality is important, very important in a decision-making process and therefore it is well, like uh, they, uh, they should be seeking that. And um, CSOs should be appropriately represented in the reg in, uh, regulators and government committees forums uh, uh, on behalf of consumers. That is also very, very important because um, many, many a time they miss including civil society organizations and we have uh, literally fought with the governments to actually include uh, civil society representatives in, in all these uh, committees so that the voice of consumers is heard. I think it's very important. And uh, research-based advocacy on consumers' perspectives uh, issues will help actually making better policies that are consumer friendly. Uh, even uh, for with the uh, uh, financial uh, finance regulator in the country, actually this is what uh, we are saying. We are asking for, like please go to the, um, uh, like come to the consumers, see what their uh, concerns are, if they have any issues, just do a st study, do a audits. And based on that, you come up with policies so that it's consumer friendly and uh, consumers are able to actually um, benefit out of it, actually. And collective consumer voices, of course, it is a very important tool that we need to leverage upon. And uh, using technology today, I think um, uh, like we cannot live, we cannot stay away from technology. So using technology as a means to connect consumers and decision makers is also very important and uh, I think uh, these tools will help actually in uh, uh, leverage, uh, uh, leveraging this change that we need to elevate the consumer's voice. I think those yes. were seven, sorry, Saroja. No. no cool. just... Those were seven very practical, really uh, important tools and approaches that uh, consumer groups can do together. Thank you. Um, Felicia, you shared with us some of the challenges uh, related to financial inclusion that are linked to a broader economic situation. Are there um, tools or approaches that you would really like to see this new international community of consumer advocates build for fair digital finance? Oh, and I think you're, it's the classic, you're on mute, Felicia. Sorry, could you come off? There we are. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. okay. Sorry. So um, 
every consumer regulation should start from the national level. But in the case of digital financial services, we know that such services cost across nations. And that is why our international capacity building is important. And one area that um, uh, consumer advocates should uh, address is the area of implementation and uh, uh, consumer redress. In fact, consumer redress is the key thing. The reason is that if I make a transfer from Nigeria to the US or any country, the, uh, the, the, the internal enforcement mechanism we have may not assist the consumer, may not assist the person that I sent the money to. So, but if we have an international corporation or an international platform that addresses the uh, consumer redress, it will be very easy. And that is why there's a, pro a provision in the United Nations uh, guidelines on consumer protection, the revised edition 2015 on international cooperation. I think we should leverage on that, on those provisions because not just one provision, we should look at those provisions very well and see how we can incorporate them into what we are doing because international cooperation is important. So, um, Michael has mentioned uh, technology Sophie, in fact, all our colleagues, Saroja, all the points they mentioned, I subscribe to them. We, we must be vast, we must have, we must, of course, we must um, train our consumer uh, experts, but because even though they're experts, but we know that digital financial services present the unique, uh, unique problems, unique technological problems. So we need to uh, do capacity building. We need to share information. We need to share country studies, case studies, um, and best practices. So all these things should come at the international level. So that if you are transacting, and you know that the, uh, the um, transaction may affect somebody in another country, if you have a platform where the person can just uh, get easy redress, you'll be comfortable with the system, and that other person will be comfortable. So we need that international cooperation. We need capacity building, um, uh, information sharing and others. Best practices, because what a country may have as the best practice may not be available in another country. But if we collaborate, then we have a platform that is trusted, a platform that people can trust and a platform that can enhance uh, digital financial services. That's brilliant. And Felicia, I completely agree with it. It's really lovely to hear the commonality in terms of let's build using technology for consumers across all the, uh, the different interventions. I'd love to come back to Sophie. Um, in what you've heard, I mean, I think you suggested a number of ways in which consumer advocates could act. And I hope you feel encouraged in hearing right back at you all of those ideas. I'd love your view in particular, though, on the sort of the international regulation. How do we how do we sort of come as a group and build there? Do you have any reflections for us as we as we embark on this? So first, I, I do agree that an effective, coordinated international community of consumer advocates can really participate in important conversations at, at regional or, or global levels um, to influence global agendas. I think what you can do is uh, different things. First is put trends on the table that affect us all. And so it speaks to monitoring and sharing information among each other around the risks that are evolving um, and what they look like and sharing that information back um, at a global level to coordinate action. I think you can be particularly influential when it comes to cross-border risk because you know, national risk are easy, more easy to address within, within a, a, a national borders, but when it comes to cross-border risk, and we know that with digital financial services, there is an increasing cross-border nature to the services, these need coordinated action and provide the legitimacy for a global uh, consumer advocacy group to, to be at the forefront. I think the third um, type of agenda for which you would have a, a, a very important role to play is in highlighting 
the areas, the agendas that are global in nature that are really important for the world. So when, for instance, I was talking and Michael was talking about the fact that um, women are more likely to be impacted by the risk and to suffer from the risk and be brought back um, in terms of empowerment, et cetera, by the risk, that is a global agenda that everybody cares about. So again, you have a, a very clear role to play there in showing the commonalities. Um, I also want to highlight that I think the beauty of a, of a coordinated international group, um, if you have transparency, as uh, I think Felicia mentioned, is that you will have a, a wealth of data and evidence to bring to the global discussions, which otherwise you wouldn't. Um, you, will you will have millions in the way of data points, um, as well as cases around best practices and solutions that can really strengthen your voice globally. Now, this being said, uh, this is not your question, but I also think that it's important to realize that a group like yours is not just a global voice group. It's also a community of practice for your day-to-day -day challenges. Um, and whether it is together or bilaterally or by subgroup, it's also a wonderful opportunity to you know, discuss new ideas, document emerging good practices, solve common problems, and in general, work towards your common objective. Um, and so I think it's, you, you also need to see it that way. It's a tool for your day-to-day -day collaboration. But I'll stop here. Absolutely. Thank you, Sophie. I'd like to come back to Michael. You heard, um, now you work with um, a youth network. You're primarily working with younger consumers. Um, I'd love a little bit of your perspective on how they perceive digital finance. How can we appeal to them? And perhaps if you could reflect on this point about gender um, and how we make sure we take a gender inclusive approach as well. Could I pose you that question, Michael? Yeah, yeah. Thank you uh, for that question. I think it's it's um, it's it's very important that uh, we we acknowledge this segment of young people who are now tech savvy, and um, maybe just um, talking a little bit about our local scenario. Mobile service providers acknowledge that. Um, SIM card registration or SIM card sort of um, users include people as young as 15 years. So we're talking about um, high school uh, adolescents having access to smartphones and having access to, again, uh, digital markets because whether it's curiosity, whether it's just being technological savvy and being able to access the internet, they are intelligent. So they are consumers and they are consumers that we need to really think of. And um, it becomes a little bit complicated if they are still classified as minors because they're below the age of 18 years and probably do not have documentation like national IDs and so on and so forth. And uh, it, it poses a challenge, it poses a challenge if they have access to a smartphone and technology and these digital financial services per se, then they're also vulnerable to fraud. Now, being young, one, they might have a challenge even just recognizing that it is fraud, or they might get into situations where they really do not know what to do. An example would be, uh, transferring money using the mobile phone sometimes has in incidences where money is sent to the wrong person. So if you have young people and um, if they're girls, for example, and that becomes now a gender issue, a 16-year-old girl uh, receives money on her phone or a phone that is probably registered by the parent or caregiver or whoever else, but she has the phone. She goes to, uh, with the phone to school or uh, uses the phone during the holidays because parents feel that it's, it's convenient. Now, if somebody sends money and they quickly start calling her and probably threatening her or uh, yeah, trying to get that money back or uh, that kind of uh, situation becomes very, very difficult because they get scared, they do not know what to do or um, they don't really understand what, what, are, what are the implications. I was just saying earlier, I was talking to somebody earlier and say that 
if you get people, young people who um, um, are able to engage in some of these financial sort of services or digital space and get become mischievous without knowing the consequences. Should they be punished? Or should we now probably include an element of education on digital financial services as part of basic education, which again is something that could be centered towards the youth because they're coming to a space again, like I mentioned earlier, is evolving. It can only grade, it become big and bigger. So we need to include them. And women and girls are quite vulnerable when it comes to, to some of these, just making choices, some of the consequences, uh, terms and conditions of use of some of the products that are found digitally can be very confusing. So I think it's important that uh, even as we discuss, we create safety sort of measures, safety nets, and uh, maybe put a focus on education, empowerment of these young people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you for, for taking us from the, the global picture to, to making sure we remember the individual instances and the reality of what this is like for people um, in the, the digital marketplace. So Roger, could I come to you? Um, you we've been talking about the broad issues. Um, then we've been talking about what are the tools and levers that this group can use? What are your hopes for the accelerator as we move forward um, for the rest of this year? So um, I think I, uh, it, 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 it is a very good tool, I feel, to start with, and it has it, it, it will be dynamic. So we will be, uh, I'm sorry, are you able to see me? Yes, we can see you and hear you very well. Okay, fine, thank you. So I think uh, it's, a, it, it's a very dynamic tool and we need to be feeding information and uh, updating information there. And uh, yeah, so once that is done, I'm sure it's going to be very useful if it is regularly used. And we actually look for information there and if we are able to, uh, it, it also helps in comparing with other countries, uh, this tool. So I think it, 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 it will be very useful if we are going to use it in a proper manner uh, periodically. So yeah. That is what I feel actually, because that, that's where we will uh, like lack. Over a period in time, people may actually uh, like tend to not visit the uh, play site often or uh, things like that are bound to happen. I think that is something that we need to make sure that uh, we are if um, able to check and if there is a prompt in some manner for everyone to do this check and to update information so that the tool is properly utilized and is actually helpful for uh, the countries. Yeah. Uh, well, I think this is a great point um, where we can talk about the community of practice that Sophie mentioned. I think this is far more than just a site that you have to go and see. This is about you know regular conversations, um, uh, opportunities where people sort of know that you're looking for a particular case study and reach out to you with it, um, hotlines so that you could be saying, but I'm experiencing this question, who else has, has dealt with that and how did they approach it? So I completely agree with you. And I think this is where we build the community of practice. But I think you had, so, you had a couple of other comments, Saroja, excuse me. Oh. No, Elena, this is what I wanted to say, actually. Yeah. Perfect. So let's make it a true, a true living tool. Excellent. And Felicia, then, for you, how do you see uh, the accelerator building over the course of the coming year? What would you like to see this year? Felicia, you're on mute. First, I must say, uh, um tell you that it's a very good tool. In fact, this morning I listened to the uh, Global Consumer Index. That's another uh, good uh, uh, initiative by Consumers uh, International. I don't know why Helena is not mentioning it because um, it's something that consumer uh, organizations should leverage on to do their programs. 
Then this accelerator, this uh, digital financial um, um, services, this uh, digital finance, um, fair digital finance accelerator is also a very good tool. And uh, what, 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 I, what I can say is that it's a new tool. So we also need to study very well, see how it can work. And uh, we need to have uh, workshops, exchange, we exchange ideas on the best way to implement. And uh, of course, I have not gone through, it's, it's yet to be circulated. So, but uh, one thing I should also suggest is that if it's not there, we should have a review, uh, a review period stated uh, in it, just like the uh, global uh, financial index. Because when you bring out um, a, a program, it's very good at that moment because it's current. But with time, and this uh, digital finance is moving very fast. So it's, we, we should have a provision to review it. But meanwhile, uh, we should uh, study it, share ideas, check how we can, uh, how, how we can leverage on the provisions uh, to, um, to uh, uh, moderate our activities or to coordinate our activities. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Felicia. And um, of course, you're referring to the Global Consumer Protection and Empowerment Index, uh, which we launched in a pilot form this morning. Um, so it's only for members at the moment, but I completely agree. It can be a really helpful tool to look at uh, the relative status of consumer protection around the world. That's on a, a top level, not specifically related to financial services, but perhaps something similar could be built within the network. So um, thank you all for such a vibrant and constructive conversation. I know we've gone through a whole sweep of issues. We started out with, in this very difficult economic situation, um, what are the key issues? We talked about financial inclusion. We talked about financial literacy. We talked about gender. We talked about indebtedness. We talked about privacy. Um, we talked about redress and the difficulty of finding enforcement and um, justice. We commented that those are truly global issues and um, there are uh, consumer advocates who are addressing these at national level, but an international community is certainly felt as an important uh, opportunity, not just for learning, but to create a community of practice that builds together and has a global voice. Um, we will build on the lessons from the past, as Michael uh, uh, commented. We will build international cooperation, as Felicia uh, highlighted, and we will use technology um, to help us, as I think the majority of the panelists commented. And yet we will not forget the individual. Uh, we will make sure that we are always speaking for the individual consumer um, to help build for them a safe fair and sustainable marketplace. Um, and I'm really excited. I just want to say we have been building a rather wonderful team, which will be driving and leading the Fair Digital Finance Accelerator. I think they're probably listening in and we're looking forward to introducing them. So thank you, because this will have been not only inspiring uh, for us, but also for the new team uh, that will be supporting you in the years ahead. Are there any final comments? Maybe we could ask for 30 seconds from each of you on um, what accelerating fair digital finance means for you, okay? Um, and I would ask for a chat storm in the audience. A chat storm is where on three, two, one, you put in one word, um, into the chat and then we all press send at the same time. Okay, so we're going to listen to our panelists with 30 seconds each and then I'm going to go three, two, one and we're going to look at our chat storm. Okay, so Saroja, 30 seconds. What does accelerating fair digital finance mean for you? Inclusive and safe and uh, protected finance, yeah, digital financial services. Beautiful, thank you. Michael. Yes, for me, I think it means building uh, for better, building for better. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Sophie. For me, it is about enabling digital financial services to deliver on their financial inclusion promise and leverage millions out of exclusion. 
Beautiful, thank you. And Felicia, and I hope everyone's ready with their chat storm. Felicia, what does Accelerate yes. Fair Digital Finance mean to you? Um, increasing consumer awareness, that's number one. And number two is uh, public, uh, publicizing the benefits of digital financial services. Thank you. And three, two, one, if we can see whether the chat storm reflects what we're hearing. Yes, safe, inclusive, equity. I think we're all aligned. Well, thank you so much to everyone joining the panel. Thank you so much to my wonderful panelists. And let's accelerate fair digital finance together. Stay safe, stay well. We look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank, Thank you. you.